Music law. Not something that's front of mind for most musicians. Don't fight it, get clued up on it. This is Anyone Can Play Guitar, the podcast for musicians and music lovers that takes you behind the scenes of the music industry. This week is brought to you in partnership with MGR Music. Ever wanted to learn an instrument, hone your skills or pick up something completely new? You can get so far by yourself, however professional guidance can make all the difference. With a network of tutors right across the UK and rates starting from as little as £15 per hour, visit mgrmusic.com now to get started. Hello and welcome from what was and still is a cold Newcastle upon Tyne and a warm Los Angeles for episode number 57 on Music Law with me, James, and him, Ben. Last week we discussed some of the ways to make a career in music without being on stage or write music for yourself with Matthew and Lee, two people from our partner, MGR Music. As many of the musicians that I work with go through phases as, as they uh, are in their band where, for example, the festival period is intensely busy and, and they'll be earning quite a lot of money, but other times of the year actually there is not that many gigs or maybe they're not actually uh, being able to have that creative time maybe uh, a member of their bands away or um, this that and the other and actually a consistent income is about meaning that maybe every week or every month that you have a similar amount of income across the year today it's the law how much do you know about music law ben not a lot i remember reading a book in university for my dissertation which mentioned the law and how important <laughs> it was and how a lot of your advance went to the law Mm. Um, that is pretty much as I know it's important and it's costly but it also is important hence why it's costly yeah even just doing the prep for this interview reminded me how much I don't know <laughs> I thought you were even doing the prep for this interview where you were going to say I had to like sign a lot of disclaimers <laughs> <laughs> no I looked at all of the different topics and thought mm, I know a tiny bit about that mm-hmm. I know nothing about that I know a little bit about that, boy. Yeah. Scratching the surface at best. Yeah. I read a chapter in a book 16 years ago. (laughs) So, what do musicians need to know about the law? Where do they often get tripped up? This week, we speak to Erin Jacobson, the music lawyer, whose clients range from Grammy to Emmy award winners. There is an absolute boatload of insight today from Erin. Love this interview. It would be extremely useful for musicians in terms of what they need to know, what they don't need to know, what you should do straight away, what can wait for later, common pitfalls. It's got the lot. So much so, Ben, it's a two-parter. It's a fact. Yeah. I like facts. Mm -hmm. Remember, a great way to support the show is to go on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give us a rating and a review. It really does make a massive difference for the show. Now... On with the episode. This um, episode, James, a bit of a gateway episode between our... Oh, it's the gate open. I I got that. Good. Uh, Between our episodes on specific topics, like the specials as I've been calling them, Mm. and as you know, all these topics have multiple guests in each episode, compared to with what's coming soon, James, which is the full interviews from our guests over the next 20 odd weeks or so. Yeah, so as we're promised, we're going to release every standalone interview with the guests in their entirety so that's coming up and there's um, a bit of an amalgamation of the two well it is a bit because Erin were talking about music law so a specific topic similar to the previous uh, episodes of season two but also it's you know standalone interview as well with with Erin it but it, it was just that long because there was that much to cover yeah. and Erin was really generous with her time so it's uh yeah, it's not the sort of thing we've spoke to many guests about for many reasons. I think a lot of musicians don't know much about this. Yeah, these things anyway. Yeah, um, that's why they pay money to other people to do it. Yeah. So 
We start with the usual intros um, to get some quick background into Eren's career and then we'll dive straight into the content. So enjoy. Erin, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm great. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. I think we've established so far just before we've uh, kicked the show off that it's a lot darker and colder here than it is where you are. This is true, yes. Uh, <laughs> it's daytime and sunny in Los Angeles. Yeah, well, I'm not envious at all. It's, uh, I'm not at all. <laughs> no, not one bit. So it's absolutely great to have you on the show. The Law, something that myself and I know a lot of other musicians out there are certainly not particularly knowledgeable about. Often, you know, people get into music because they love music and they love writing music or, or all of the great things that come with music and sort of thinking about the law is not necessarily top of the uh, the list of of things uh, that they've got on their mind I would I would imagine so I guess before we before we sort of dive into a whole host of things that we want to cover with you could you just give a, a bit of an introduction on yourself who you are your background and, and your sort of career to date Sure. So I am a music lawyer, more specifically a music transactional lawyer, which means I handle contracts. I don't do lawsuits. And I also don't do shopping, which is basically when you're trying to get people a record deal or different types of deals. So I represent songwriters, composers, artists, music publishers, independent record labels, managers, producers. My clients range from Grammy and Emmy award winners to people just starting out in music. And then I also represent legacy catalogs, which are older music catalogs, as well as estates or heirs of uh, songwriters or composers, people like that. Nice. So, so what what got you into the music side of law then to start with? Yeah, I've always loved music and just been a big music fan. I'm actually not a musician, but I've always called myself a professional appreciator. <laughs> it's just always been something I've been passionate about. And I did not know really any career paths in the music business besides being a musician. So I always felt that that was not something I would be involved in from a professional standpoint. And then when I went to university, they actually had a music business program. And so I learned about what agents did, what managers did, copyrights, contracts, and that there are attorneys that will, you know, handle the copyrights and the contracts and protect their artist clients. And I thought that that was the coolest job ever and I couldn't believe that that was a real job. (laughs) And so after I learned that it actually was a real job, I said, that's what I'm going to do. And I just never looked back after that. So I had started while I was still at university, I had started actually as a DJ at our campus radio station and I would have an independent band in the studio with me every week for an interview and uh, was promoting concerts on campus. And then after I graduated, I actually had a podcast as well, focusing on independent music in Los Angeles. And I had done an internship at Capitol Records. I worked in radio. I had done promotion for artists and then went to law school. And again, my law school had uh, an entertainment law program. So I really learned all about the copyrights and music contracts. And I worked at a few different law firms and music companies. And then after I graduated and got licensed as an attorney, then I uh, started my own practice. And I've been doing that ever since. Excellent. Well, it sounds great that for anyone, when you find something that you're really passionate about and, you know, that this is something that I can spend all of my time doing because it's something I love. So that, that sounds like a, a great way to get into it. Yeah, it's it's I love it. I get to speak with 
you know, creative people all day or people that are um, handling music or own music. And we talk about music and music rights all day. (laughs) A lot of those conversations skew into just music that we love to listen to because I think most people that work in the music business are really music fans at heart as well. So there's the camaraderie based on that as well. Brilliant. Okay, so let, let's dive into some of the, the topics then that we want to cover. And, and we'll undoubtedly uncover as we go through uh, these that my level of knowledge is not great on a lot of these topics. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, this is, <laughs> we'll be learning. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So first one on, on my list that we're going to look at was copyright. So Things that, what can be placed under copyright? When might a musician want to consider this? And, and if they do, you know, how would they go about doing it? Right. Okay. So before I directly answer that question, I just have to give a little disclaimer about the information that I'm going to share. No problem. Uh, firstly, it's not legal advice. It's just for informational purposes. These are the disclaimers I have to give as an attorney. Um, It does not, the information that I'm giving today does not create an attorney-client relationship between me and anyone listening to the podcast. If you do have a legal issue, please seek an attorney in your area for advice. And if anything I say is considered advertisement, it's just general in nature, not directed towards any specific person. And also, as you and I spoke about offline when we were scheduling this is that I am based in the United States. I'm licensed in California. So anything that I talk about is going to be from that perspective, but it might differ based on where you are. So I know you, you know, you're in Newcastle, (laughs) I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. So it's the the UK laws are a little bit different than US laws. And even within the US, we have some state variances based on contracts sometimes, even though copyright is throughout the US overall. So with that said, just (laughs) if you have a, a legal issue, make sure you get the right advice for where you are located. Yeah. But in general, so copyright, as far as the United States copyright goes, Anything that is sufficiently original to be under copyright protection, which basically means it's not just like an idea or something, but it's actually more fleshed out than that. And it's what we call fixed in a tangible medium of expression, which basically means you've written it down you've recorded it, it, you've translated that into some sort of tangible form that can be reproduced, such as a a digital file, a piece of paper with lyrics written on it, something like that. that. At that moment, it is technically copyrighted under the US law. However, when you register, you file a copyright registration application with the United States Copyright Office, that gives you certain benefits that you don't get if you don't register it. So for example, it allows your work to be listed in the public database of copyright, which then also gives you the presumption that you're the owner of that work because you're listed on the copyright certificate. It also gives a date of creation. So the copyright office and the courts, if there's ever any sort of copyright infringement lawsuit or issue, they look to the date that's on that copyright registration as the date of creation for that work. So the kind of DIY things people tend to do, like mailing it to yourself or thinking the date that it's posted on the internet is sufficient, they're not really sufficient. A court is still going to look to the date on that copyright registration. Also, it has some other benefits such as the law provides for a certain amount of uh, monetary recovery in these types of cases, which you're not eligible for if you don't have a registration. You actually cannot sue in federal court for infringement if you don't have a registration. So there's 
definite benefits. And I always advocate that everybody should be registering their copyrights uh, to get those protections. Uh, that's that's interesting. Uh, and the, the whole emailing yourself, I, I know various people who have done that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so that's uh, interesting to, uh, to hear. Uh, something you said there, Erin, um, when you were saying something that was sufficiently original, I feel like that could be very much open to interpretation. But... It is quite open <laughs> to interpretation. Yeah, it's it's basically, you know, did you come up with something that, I mean, I can't think of another word besides original, but yeah. did, you know, is it something that, that you created, I guess, that's not so simple that it wouldn't be protected because it's just such a common thing that everybody does? Or... You know, it's not just a blatant copy of yeah. something that someone else has done. But yeah, I mean, there's certain things. There's also a lot of myths that float around like, oh, well, if you do three notes or something or 30 seconds of someone else's song, it's that that's not considered infringement. And those things are not actually true. There's been no ruling to say that those are allowed. But there are certain situations where something like a common blues riff uh, in a guitar that you would hear in you know, every blues song and a whole bunch of rock songs that have been influenced by blues music, things like that, it becomes so common that using that one riff would probably not be considered infringement. But that's just because that's happened over time, not because oh, it's okay to use those three notes or that chord progression or something. So these infringement things end up on a case-by-case -case basis a lot of times. Right. Oh, that That's interesting as well because, yeah, it, again, a fairly common one that you've mentioned that, that I hear is, well, there's only been this amount of seconds played right. there for it. Uh... Yeah, I hear it all the time. It drives me crazy. <laughs> true and then people rely on that and then you know can get themselves in trouble that way okay so in terms of the the when um an, an artist might right. want to go down the the route of actually copywriting their their material because i for for some artists they might have written hundreds of songs right. many of which will be rubbish and they'd never want to you know see right. the light of day anyway but then i guess at, at what point do you typically see people going down that route right so it kind of depends on the person and what they're doing so for example the ones that have written 100 good songs but you know 200 that are rubbish that are never going to see the light of day you know maybe you don't spend the money copywriting those because you're not going to do anything with them and nobody's ever going to see them but if you're actually going to be putting that music out there sending it out to companies, potentially collaborating with other people, even releasing it yourself as an artist, you would want to copyright it because if it's out there and it's potentially earning money, there's potential for it to be infringed as well. And you want to be protected if that happens. Yeah, that makes now, sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I always say that earlier is better but you also want it to be finished too because if you there's different ways to do it if i mean if it's not finished you could just do an initial application and then do a second application when it is finished because it depends also whether it's been published or not but if you're filing an early application and then you're changing the the song for example because it wasn't finished yet when you first filed it only those new parts that you've added are going to be protected. So the best thing to do is file it when it's finished because then it's protected as it is released. Right. But again, if you if you feel like there's potential risk and you want to make sure it's protected even before it's finished, then you can certainly do that. But then you would also want to file a second application once it is finished because if you only filed the earlier application, then the new things that you added would not be protected if you did not file a second application. Does okay. that make sense? Okay, no, it, it, it does. The, the nuances of registration can get quite complicated. <laughs> I, I can imagine. 
S- something that sprang to mind when you were talking through that, Erin, yeah. was a lot of artists might post a work in progress to various different websites or social forums or whatever it might be to get some feedback or even to collaborate or what are there any sort of potential issues there and if if someone did take a work in progress and then use it for something and then you only i I guess went down the copywriting route at the point of completion it does does that make sense is there a potential yeah well that's exactly kind of the situation that would be applicable to what I was explaining about, you know, when something is not finished, because if you're, if you post something that's not finished, because maybe you want to collaborate with someone or you want feedback and you haven't filed anything, it's going to be harder to prove if there's, if somebody then takes that unfinished piece of music and copies it Mm -hmm. um, or infringes upon it. So it, that would be a situation when when I would say it might be better to do two applications. I've definitely had people come to me with issues where maybe they had an instrumental and then they had somebody write lyrics to it, but then they didn't like the lyrics that that person wrote. So then they wanted to take it to somebody else to write new lyrics. And so then it becomes a, a question where you have these different works you have the instrumental you have this other version with the lyrics and then you want to do this new version with lyrics so that's where this kind of registering in stages would be beneficial because you wouldn't want the person that initially wrote the instrumental to then not be able to use that instrumental because it's now tied with these lyrics that they don't want it to be tied with And some of it depends on whether it's a joint work as well as to whether these two people wrote a song together intending for the music and the lyrics to be together or if it was two separate situations where somebody wrote an instrumental and then somebody else wrote lyrics later and they were not created at the same time. This week is brought to you in partnership with MGR Music. Ever wanted to learn an instrument, hone your skills, or pick up something completely new? You can get so far by yourself, however, professional guidance can make all the difference. With a network of tutors right across the UK, and rates starting from as little as £15 per hour, visit mgrmusic.com now to get started. Up now is the good cause of the week, and this week it's Erin. We've heard about many good causes that our guests are close to over the first two seasons, with this one being a particularly personal message. A cause I really like to support is research for neuroendocrine cancer, which is a really rare type of cancer that is often misdiagnosed and still does not have effective treatment or really many options for treatment. And I set up a fund that goes toward neuroendocrine cancer research specifically to the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation in memory of my mom, Sandy, who really most courageously battled this disease. And I know that she would want other people to be helped by this research. So... I've provided a link that is in the show notes to this fund and anything that is donated will be matched by the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation. So really anything that gets donated will be doubled. So it's an important cause to me personally. And like I said, I know my mom would be happy to be helping other people battling this disease. We're in the festive period, which is always a time for reflection and sharing. The fact that the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation will match any donations to Erin's Fund is fantastic. So if you can spare anything, I know that it would be very much appreciated by so many people, not least Erin herself. As Erin mentioned, if you would like to donate, the link will be in the show notes on our website. So click the links in your podcast app or go directly to acpgmusic.com 
forward slash episode 057. Now, back to the episode. So I'm straight back into the Erin interview and we pick back up on the topic of music composition and sound recording. If we yeah. if we move on from uh, from copywriting then, the next thing we had on the list, which I'll definitely ask you to, to sort of um, flesh out the detail on, is um, yeah. the separation of music composition and sound recording. Yes. So in the music business and in copyright, the composition of the music, which is the word, the lyrics, the the music, the notes, that aspect of it, that is considered a separate entity from the recording of that composition. So most of the time, just in general, as a music listener, it seems like one and the same. But the way that I like to describe it is by using an example of the song Yesterday. So that's the Beatles song Yesterday. It was, you know, credited as a Lennon-McCartney composition, although, you know, the, Be- the Beatles fans know that it was all Paul on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that is the composition, you know, that, those, that guitar part, you know, the lyrics of it, that's the composition. Now, the Beatles did a recording of that. That was the first recording, the one that everyone knows. But also, Elvis Presley did a recording of it. Frank Sinatra did a recording of it. And several thousand other people did a recording of it because it's actually one of the most covered songs in the history of music. So, again, we still have one composition, which is that Lennon McCartney credited composition. That's the only composition. But then we have all these different recordings of it, which are all separate entities and separate copyrights in their own right. So again, the Beatles recording is one entity and copyright. The Elvis version is another one. The Frank Sinatra version is another one. And every other one of those people that recorded that is those are all separate recordings with separate copyrights. So when we deal in music, especially in music licensing, for example, if we would like to license a song to be in a film, for example, we have to get a license for the composition and the recording of that composition. So they're always treated as separate entities and they have separate royalty streams and it's it makes for a lot more moving parts, but because that's the way it is, it's always something that needs to be kept in mind. Okay, so if uh, an artist, and just see if I, I'm, I'm understanding this, so if an artist had yeah. recorded a, a song, so they'd, they'd written the composition and then they'd recorded it, um, mm-hmm. when they go to copyright that, so say at this point they're not planning on anybody ever covering it or nobody right. else had any plans, at that point, would they initially look to go down the double copyright path in the first instance? Yeah, that's how I recommend doing it, actually. I, when I'm filing applications on behalf of clients, I will file two separate applications. There, I believe there is a way to file it under one application, but I don't like doing that because... Again, they're separate entities, and I want to make sure each entity is properly protected. I don't want there to be a question of, well, was that really included under this application? Did we get all the parts mm-hmm. in there? So so I do separate applications. Yeah, no, well, that makes good sense. Okay, so moving on to a one that will be close to, to many, particularly DIY musicians, I'm, I'm sure, is royalties. Um, right. You know, getting paid, it's it's key. <laughs> yeah, get, getting paid is immensely important. And uh, I always advocate that you, as an artist, you need to understand not necessarily every nuance of royalties, but you at least have to have a basic understanding of what they are and how you get paid for them and where you need to be registered to get paid for them because this is 
your craft or even if it's a hobby because you have a day job, you know, maybe you want to transition to full-time music or at least, you know, this is something that you're putting effort into and, and so you should benefit from the effort that you're putting out. Oh, couldn't, couldn't right. agree more. Could not agree more. So, yeah. so, so for well, our more novice then, I, I guess, what are the different types of, of royalties and, and where the hell would they start? Right. So again, they're going to be separated based on whether you're talking about the composition or the recording. So on the composition side, one type of royalty is called mechanical royalties. And those, the, the when we're talking about physical product, like a CD uh, or a vinyl or whatnot, that is actually it's tied to the reproduction right and copyright and it's basically what the record label pays to the music publisher for the privilege of mechanically reproducing that composition onto a record so in the u.s they're set by law and there's so they're currently at 9.1 cents per song for that is five minutes or less now with the digital age we also have something called streaming mechanicals so that applies to interactive streaming services which would be a service like spotify where you can choose what you want to listen to as opposed to a service like pandora where you're not choosing it's coming up more like a radio format and that is because they've determined that there is a data reproduction when you're playing these songs uh so a streaming mechanical is uh is appropriate or is triggered in that situation so that and the rates for those are crazy <laughs> <laughs> to, to try and explain it is would you know not be helpful it's very complicated so just know that they're there okay. and you should collect them <laughs> um the next type of royalty is performance and that is when music is played publicly so in the u.s that's television radio live concerts uh and also streaming and in outside of the u.s that also includes movie theaters but we don't have that that right in the u.s but it's when the music is performed to the public and that is it's a very important one because you know anytime if you have your music out on spotify or any of those digital streaming services and people are listening to it that is considered a performance you want to be earning those those royalties another royalty which is not as common for newer compositions but definitely for older compositions is print so that's if you're buying um, like one of those Hal Leonard books with the right. guitar tab and that, that sort of thing. So that would be print and there are royalties paid for that. And then it's not a royalty, it's a fee, but it's worth mentioning is if you get a synchronization of your music in a film or a TV show, any sort of audiovisual production, uh, you'll have to do a synchronization license to allow that. And there's a fee that gets paid for that. So it's an upfront fee that's negotiated in the contract. And there'll be a fee for the composition and a fee for the recording. And then after that upfront fee, once that TV show airs, for example, then that's when you'll start earning the performance money on that. So there's different royalties will kind of start playing in together on the same uses. So that's on the composition side. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> on the recording side, there's sales. So that's, again, we still have paid digital downloads. So if you get someone downloading your song that's up for sale there's a royalty that comes with that you get a share of the income so that's sales there's also digital performance royalties so that's when the recording it's this is like 
the recording component to the performance royalty that we just talked about for compositions. So, but it's only for digital in the US. So that would be satellite radio and streaming also. And then the other thing, which we don't have as much in the US, it's more prevalent in Europe and outside the US is neighboring rights. But again, that's sort of the same concept as those digital performance royalties for the recording. And then the other, tell me if I'm going too fast. But <laughs> no, then, no. <laughs> kind of the, last, the last thing is, again, not really a royalty, but something to be aware of is ad revenue for sites like YouTube. Because if you have a, enough followers and enough or subscribers and enough views on YouTube, you are able to share in the ad revenue for your channel if you have allowed ads to be on your videos. So that's an, another revenue stream that if you don't if you don't know to collect it, it's you're losing out on money. I've I've had clients where they didn't know to collect that and then I've said to them well, are you collecting your YouTube? And they said, what do you mean? And I showed them where to log in and look for it. And, you know, there was a couple hundred dollars sitting there waiting for them. And, and then they were doing well on views. So that ended up being a few extra hundred dollars per month for that. So, and that, that can make a difference, especially at a, at a startup stage. So Oh, definitely, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, so for there's different places to register to help you collect these uh, different types of royalties, but I would say for performance, the, the main ones in the U.S. are ASCAP and BMI. In the U.K., that would be PRS. So, you know, if you're not signed up with those, definitely look into how to get signed up because other... All of these things, if you're not if you're not registered properly, you're basically just leaving money on the table that's owed to you. Yeah, with, without a doubt. So, so what does a musician need to sign up with one of those agencies, companies? Right. Help? It depends on the agency. So, you know, in the U.S., it, it's just filing an application. I believe it's similar for PRS and. Sometimes there's a fee involved, but again, that just depends on who you're signing up with. Some have a fee, some don't. The fees vary a little bit. I mean, usually it's in the U.S., it's depending on what you're registering for, it can run up to a couple hundred dollars, I believe. To register as a publisher with PRS, I believe it's somewhere around 400 pounds or 300 pounds, something like that. But but if you're just registering as a writer, I'm not sure what the what the fees are. So they're very nice. You can contact them and ask, or I, th- I think it's all laid out on their website as well. So how does and that I- link in with um, with copywriting? So if if an artist hasn't copyrighted their music, mm-hmm. uh, does that exclude them from the ability to collect royalties? Do you need to have gone down that road, or how do, how That's does that a- work? Really good question. Um, no, it doesn't. But again, if there's any sort of dispute, you need to be able to show that you are, in fact, the owner of that work. So they don't ask you for copies of the copyright certificates when you are collecting royalties <laughs> or registering for one of these collection agents. But again, you, you do need that in place in, in case any problems arise. Yep. So there, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of things that need to be registered to <laughs> to be all properly set up as as a, a writer or an artist. Surprisingly, yeah, no, no the the no. list is growing here. <laughs> yeah. And as far as I mean, we only mentioned ASCAP, BMI, and the PRS, but every country has their own performance rights organization. Some of them also handle mechanical royalties. Some of them do not. So it just depends what country you're in, because I'm sure there's people listening from all over the world right now. So check for your country. I mean, you can just Google like the name of your country and performance rights organization or something like that, and you'll be able to find which one is, is yours. Brilliant. So you were right, James. This is the interview that you did. Uh, and there was lots of great insights there 
And the good news is, we're only halfway through the conversation with Erin. Indeed we are, yes. I'm just listening to it again. I'm already learning things. <laughs> that you'd remembered and forgot. Yeah. <laughs> really useful. So, he has a little uh, surprise for you, James. Coming up next week, in part two, it's Erin. But we're going to talk a little bit more about contracts, publishing and record deals. Mm. Now, I think this is very important if you're in a band and all of a sudden people are pushing contracts and yeah. record deals. How in many front of people you. have you read article stories over the years where they've been completely swindled by their record deal? Yeah. I, I didn't know I was signing for six albums and all this sort of stuff. But I can understand how it happens because if you're in a band and you've played, I don't know, 100 gigs over two years and all this sort of stuff, and someone goes, here's the um, yeah. more important record contract. Oh, you got a ten grand advance. Oh, you don't get any more money after that. <laughs> yeah. And the ten grand disappears. <laughs> yeah, all sorts of things. So, yeah, here's a little flavour of next week from Erin. What type of deal is available to you at that time? Because as a brand new writer, you're not going to have... You know, you're you're going to have more risk, really, because you don't have the bargaining power to to negotiate a better deal. Even if you have a good lawyer, you just, you, you still might, might not be able to, to do that. And then as you get more famous, the more people want you, so they're willing to make you a better deal or take less ownership or whatever the situation is. Additional news snippets from the interviews you've heard today will pop up in other episodes later in the season. And at the end of season two, we'll release each conversation with all of our guests in full as standalone episodes. As a reminder, if you like the show, please, please take a few seconds just to give us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts from. It makes a huge difference in helping us grow our audience and promoting the show. All of the show notes for today's episode can be found at acpgmusic.com, along with our back catalogue of episodes. If you like what you hear, or perhaps have some improvements or specific guests you'd like us to consider, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at info at acpgmusic.com or hit us up on social media. Keep supporting upcoming artists and we'll catch you next time.